I really think first it goes back to can you offer value? Because if you can't offer value, you may be charismatic, you may be good at sales, you can sell somebody. If you can't keep the customers you have, you don't have a business. Hello there and welcome back to the My Future Business Show. It is wonderful to have you with us today as it uh, is always. Now, if this is your first time joining us, not sure how you found us, but welcome. I know you're in for a treat today because on today's show, I have the pleasure of welcoming CEO and co-founder at Hip Agency, Mr. Luke Infinger. Welcome to the show, Luke. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely a joy to have you here. Now, you and I are going to be talking about what it takes to build a successful business, including the importance of marketing, branding, customer relationships, reputation management, and so much more. But we start at the start and learn a little bit more about you. So where are you calling in from today? Pensacola, Florida. Pensacola, Florida. Is that home for you or do you travel for work? Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, yeah, it is home, born and raised. I moved away for a couple years, uh, lived in Savannah, Georgia, then lived in New York City and ultimately moved back here. Thought that it was temporary, but uh, got got rooted here with multiple businesses and my family's here, my wife's family's here. And so we we are here, started, started businesses uh, 10 years ago. So yeah, wow. Yeah, pretty, yeah. Time flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? It does. It's ah. crazy to believe. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about locations uh, and landmarks around your local area. And people, if people were to visit you, what would stand out to them? Uh, really the beaches, the, the Gulf Coast, really from us, uh, I mean, over to Destin. Uh, people know that area a lot more because it's much more touristy, but 30A, yeah. There's a lot of history here. The French... Spanish and English fought over this area. Mm -hmm. um, so rich in history, and it's also the cradle for naval aviation. Fantastic. Now tell me a little bit about what you do in your pastime. I know that you're extremely busy, but do you have some time for yourself? And if you do have that free time, what do you like to do? you have any hobbies or sports? Yeah, uh, I play tennis a little bit. <laughs> um, I do a lot of gardening. Uh, oh, yeah, I live yeah. on 15 acres. Yep. So do a bit of gardening, which is fun, and just spend time with family and try and also take take care of myself. So work out, uh, do a bit of biohacking, and if uh, I could go as deep as you want to talk oh, around that. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow, that <laughs> but, sounds interesting. It's funny. When you say yeah. that amount of land, I'm thinking you do a little bit of gardening. Now, as a person that's grown up on a farm myself, tell us a little bit about what it's really like. Is Are we talking about, about industrial grade sort of uh, maintenance here? What are we talking about? <laughs> yeah, I haven't gone that far yet. Uh, so really, I just have uh, a hundred square yards really that I work with. So greenhouse, raised beds, chickens, beautiful. um, you know, a couple dogs, a couple cats, that yeah. type of thing. So haven't, haven't gone too crazy yet. Well, it's funny you should talk about this because there's lots of entrepreneurs that have not walked the path that you have thus far, Luke. And oftentimes they think I'm just going to go gun ho and it's always going to be about work and they never give themselves the opportunity to have that break. But how important is that getting away and just disappearing onto your property for a while? How important is that for you? Yeah, I would say it's very important and has become a lot more important with family. Yep. Um, you know, there's there's seasons of life like anything. You can look at a movie, a song, everything has, you know, crescendos and, you know, the climax and then more calm areas. And I think life is the same way. Yep. And so you you have to to learn that. It can't be a hundred miles per hour all the time. However, there may be a season where you have to go 100 miles per hour and you have to be okay with that. And maybe your family will have to be okay with that too. Mm -hmm. But especially as you get older, uh, you know, I don't know <laughs> if it's just me, but you realize how you have to take care of yourself uh, oh, yes. if you want to continue to show up. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the feedback. Now, you've touched on a topic that is uh, near and dear to my heart, pets. Tell me a little bit about your pets and your dogs and things. Yeah, I got a dog, a little dog, Bolt. Uh, he's a mutt and was a rescue <laughs> dog. Yep. And we, we rescued him probably nine years ago. 
and uh, he doesn't get along with other dogs too well. Uh -huh. uh, but then I have a flat coated retriever who is a little over a year old. Clementine, we call her Clemmy. Yep. Um, that's the type of dog I grew up with. So it's like a golden retriever, but it's black. Yep. Um, and she's yeah trying to train her. She's she's a wild one. <laughs> uh, I have a cat, Gracie, and I was never really a cat fan. No, but nor am I. I have to say, after having one, it is the easiest animal and, and a very smart animal, especially on a farm. It's, yes. it's nice to have her around. Yes. Um, we we had a rabbit uh, snowball that didn't work out too well. <laughs> it's hard to, hard to keep rabbits alive. <laughs> and uh, I've got eight chickens, two roosters, six hens, and. I have some still of the the first round that I had, but the first round got attacked by raccoons. Oh. So I had to figure out that problem. Oh, yes. And, you know, when other animals learn that chickens are around, uh, it can be yeah, very hard to keep them. Yeah. Yes. No, um, look, this is why the My Future Business is different because we know that businesses fundamentally don't change too much on the surface, but certainly the leadership behind the businesses and the lifestyles and, and the private lives of people do change. So I really do appreciate you sharing. Now, if we could go along that sort of same line for a moment, tell us a little bit about what life was like for you growing up. Yeah, life growing up, uh, I was homeschooled. Mm -hmm. So already that's a lot different. Um, yep. The positives around, I'll focus on the positives w within that. Mm -hmm. uh, you can ultimately create whatever you want to create uh, being homeschooled. So I... That I think that's really good for creativity because I was never told, oh, you can't do that or you can't think that way or think this way or, you know, you need to quiet down because I was really the only one around. I had older siblings, mm -hmm. um, but I was able to uh, think a lot, be creative. And also I was raised in a household where I wouldn't say we were poor, but it was more, you know, of a, a mindset that money was not really in infinite supply or really in, in a large supply at yeah. all. Yep. And so, you know, I, I feel like a lot of people my age may come from that. Uh, you know, my grandparents were in the depression, that type of thing. But as I got older, I noticed uh, the baby boomers were, you know, a very hardworking generation. Mm -hmm. And my friends started to just get a lot of things handed to them. Not necessarily a bad thing, but I had to go out and work for anything that I wanted. Yeah. So I can remember even being 14. Uh, I'd put the lawnmower in the back of the car and my mom would drive to certain streets and areas and I would go door to door just, you know, asking if people would let me mow their lawn for 20 bucks or whatever it was. Yeah. And I do think that that really helped me a lot because it instilled a level of persistence in me that I believe I still have today and has served me really well. Mm -hmm. And I can see in some friends, you know, when I talk to them or see what's going on, they just don't have that. Again, not necessarily a bad thing. Bad thing yeah. Um, but I do think that helped me a lot with how I was raised. Thank you for the feedback. I was going to ask you about your first entrepreneurial experience, and that's a wonderful story. Thanks again. Now, tell us a little bit about uh, in your formative years. Um, many of us have people around us. Um, you've talked a little bit about your parents. And um, are there other inspirational people, people that have motivated you to, uh, and, you know, in terms of your mindset growing up? Is there anybody that was like that around you? The biggest person, biggest influence on my life early on was probably my grandmother on mm -hmm. my mom's side. Yeah, yeah. And she was just a very strong, persistent woman. And I really gravitated towards how she uh, just carried herself, how she showed up, her energy. Yeah. Uh, and it, I believe that had a, a very big impact on my life as well. Yeah, they're, they're, they're cut from a different cloth, aren't they, Luke? Yeah, totally. Tell me a bit of, about your daily routine because uh, I myself am not an early riser, but often I, I find myself having to do those sorts of things. Do you? Are you an early riser? Well, I go, again, I kind of go through seasons. I just came off of 
a two year stint where I was waking up around 520 every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, working out with a trainer and a small group of guys. I recently changed that in December. And I don't know if I'll I'll keep doing what I'm doing, but now I'm working out a little bit later in the day and getting more sleep. So I I more so wake up when the sun comes up. Yep. That's around 6.30 my time right now. Yep. Um, again, not sure I'm going to uh, keep that, but just came off a, a, a two-year stint where I was waking up on most days, you know, 5.20, 5.30. Now, there is an exercise routine there. Tell us, tell us a little bit about how that yeah. goes for you. Yeah, typically I just do a total body workout. So yep. we we would run with three to four guys uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and we had a trainer uh, grenade, and uh, <laughs> it was it was pretty intense. It was fun, uh, but now I'm just doing total body workouts on YouTube. Yep. And you know, I would say the biggest benefit for me is working out, getting in the sauna for about 30, 40 minutes, getting a really good sweat, and then getting right into the cold plunge. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest benefit for me and most people I talk to, if they can get into a cold plunge, it's the most notable or noticeable difference Yay. with anything I've ever done. And now I don't know if it's because YouTube is such uh, so in our face nowadays, but I see a lot of that, and I think you must be a brave man to do that. What was it like the first time you took the plunge? <laughs> Literally, the very first time was in 2018, and it was in this giant kiddie pool in South Florida. A friend of mine, Anthony D. Clemente, has a, a Biohacker Secrets. You can look him up podcast. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And I went to a retreat, and so I was getting in this pool with probably. I don't know, 10 other guys, I completely locked up because we were unloading ice in this pool for maybe 10 minutes. I mean, it was solid Cat. ice. Yep. And I, I remember him getting in my face and yelling, breathe, uh, uh. because my arms had kind of locked <laughs> up and I was not breathing. <laughs> and I got out, I stood in the sun. So I was probably in there three minutes, got out, stood in the sun and that was South Florida in the summer. So it was probably 90 degrees or so mm -hmm. and just felt incredible. And what's interesting is I had never uh, done it much after that. I started taking cold showers, but it's not really the same. Not the same. And we bought a cold plunge probably about a year ago. And I have, I even have one at my home now. I do it on the low end three times a week. Sometimes I do it every single day. And yeah, I mean, you can look it up, just the chemical uh, reaction yes. that your body has and the chemicals that are released. The It's probably the most clear mentally that you'll ever feel, especially if you can do it outside and get out and stand in the sun. I think it, it makes a, a massive difference just in changing your state getting back to nature and changing that state you know that's wonderful thank you very much now tell us just for the sake of context luke about i guess your educational and professional background would you mind sharing a little bit sure so homeschooled uh thought i would probably not be uh, a very smart kid when i went to actual school <laughs> so i started going to uh, a college uh, a junior college locally obviously in 10th grade or so there's a program you can do called dual enrollment mm -hmm. where you're enrolled in high school but you also start taking some college classes getting those prerequisites out of the way started to do that and, and quickly built my confidence up of, of okay i was homeschooled but I, i'm not a complete dummy and uh <laughs> you know so so that was nice and really after that i started to flounder I was getting uh, jobs locally. I ended up getting a decent job uh, making videos for the uh, Gannett, who at the time Gannett owned, I don't know, 90% of the newspapers in, uh, in the U.S. Yep. And I was making short videos for job ads. But uh, luckily, the company that I worked at pushed the quality. You know, they wanted their videos to get watched and that's where I started learning After Effects, which is uh, you can do compositing and motion graphics and mm -hmm. After Effects, learning Premiere Pro. And then I went to work for a church after that. That was probably 08 when the economy crashed, the net crashed, and that job crashed. So I went to work at a church 
And churches are great places, especially if you can get in with a more modern church just for creativity and design, yeah. music. That pushed the envelope a little bit more within motion graphics. And I'll never forget this. I had a professor because I went to that junior college for graphic design after I graduated uh, high school. Mm -hmm. Had this professor, Mark Hopkins. And my sister, so this is years later, my sister came home, was taking a pottery class. Mark Hopkins happened to be in her class and said, hey, what's Luke up to these days? And she explained, and he's like, tell him he needs to do something with his life and go to SCAD. And oh. SCAD was Savannah College of Art and Design. And this yeah. professor, he was pretty polarizing. A lot of people didn't like him, but he was very honest. And so my sister came home, told me that, and it just shifted something inside of me because I think I knew, I, I actually, I know that I knew I needed to go do something and not just be stuck at home, living with my parents, working this part-time job at this church. Yep. So I started to apply. It was about a year-long process. Ended up uh, writing a series of uh, letters, submitting uh, videos and motion graphics to get scholarships. Ended up going away, getting accepted, getting a good scholarship. And it was the, the best thing for me. It was a culture shock, probably the first six months or so. But after that, it... it woke back up that competitive nature inside of me. Yeah. Uh, the the pedigree at this school is very, very high. It's one of the best design schools, arguably in the world, and they do have locations even in France and other areas. Um, and so that was really good for me, even though I don't use that skill a lot today. And we can talk a little bit about that because after I moved to New York, and got a job in a motion graphic studio, which was also really good for me. Uh, but that's where I had the realization to completely change course after that. That's great feedback. Thank you so very much. Now, I wonder in all of this, you had that external sort of influence on you. And uh, it's obviously uh, affected how you think about the world around you at that time, at least. I'm wondering how important is mindset for you today? And, and if you find yourself, I guess, deviating from, I guess, a positive mindset of any given day, how do you, how do you come back? How do you reset? Yeah, that's an interesting question. You could probably Google this, and I think the results would come up 80% of all thoughts are negative. Mm. So I think negatively, you do, sadly. Yes. And what if you could reverse that to where 80% of your thoughts were positive? What type of edge would you have on everybody else? Mm. So, you know, I think negatively, everybody does, but I try to go back to my why. And I try to now also uh, think about the things that I'm grateful for, the things that I have, uh, the things that I've been given, my family, um, all these things that you could have gratitude towards. And I would say overall mindset is huge for me. Uh, I study a lot of people from Kobe Bryant to George Washington. Yeah. And I also watch a lot of or read a lot of biographies, watch or read. Uh, either is fine. And I feel like when you do that, you can realize pretty quickly how easy we have it. Never in history has a generation had it so easy. Oh, yeah. Even even in war, you know, uh, a thousand years ago, what, what was it like? I, I mean, imagine living in World War II. Um, so you, we have a smartphone in our pocket and it's never been easier than today. And so I like comparing myself to the life of Abraham Lincoln or J.W. Marriott are these people who had exponentially harder lives and had mm. to overcome so much more. Because I hear a lot of today, you know, I'm depressed or I'm sad. And I don't want to get into that too much. No, no. I don't want to ju judge anyone. Maybe, maybe they are depressed. But mm. I think culture also has a lot to do with that and what we're told. Yep. From the news to, I mean, you could literally get online and in probably 60 seconds tell a chat bot you're depressed. And in another 60 seconds, somebody joins it, says, yeah, you are depressed. You need this medication. Yes. You may not be. No, you may no. just need to change your surrounding, your friends, 
uh, your thoughts, what you're telling yourself, your story. Uh, and so I think it's very important to, I, I feel like a lot of people don't know history or think about it. I like to go back and think about it because what's more important, you know, my life and, and my generation or, or studying 6,000 years back and everyone who possibly came before us, mm -hmm. what they had to go through. And it just gives you an, uh, a better perspective, I find, especially if you're in uh, business for yourself or in a, a pretty tough space. Again, it can just kind of give you uh, relief of people who came before us ultimately lived a much, much tougher life. And for me, I find that pretty, pretty positive that we can do just about anything, yes. you know? Absolutely. The awareness and what I'm taking from this is not only is history important for us collectively, there's also the changing dynamic and the social construct because of social media. But also one of the most important takeaways is the uh, uh, the factor of gratitude. You seem to have a an underlying tone of just being, um, you know, full of gratitude for the life that you have. That's wonderful. Now, tell me uh, a little bit about um, what's one thing, Luke, that you personally do the best, do you think? I think it's connecting with people one-on-one. -on -one. Mm. If that, if I had to narrow it down to one thing, that's what I've always been able to do uh, really well. I'm not going to say I'm the best at it, but for me and my skill set, that's probably the best skill set I have from a team member or an interesting person or maybe a prospect or uh, a, a potential partnership we could have or someone I could learn from. I just have the ability to connect. And I think it's because people can feel while I'm not the most charismatic person or best spoken person, uh, people can just feel an authenticity behind yeah. that. I hope definitely. And I, I think if you are authentic and if you are real, people respond to that. Um, so that's what I would tell people is I see all these people online who are so charismatic and can speak so well and get a big following. But at, at the end of the day, if that's not real, mm. it doesn't really matter. And so I would just say be you. And I feel like a lot of times people are really attracted to authenticity yeah just be you it's it's such an amazing a simple formula but yet so many us uh, think that they have to live up to some other standard because of social media usually but tell me a little bit about the bucket list i have a bucket list there's so many things that i want to do in my life do you have a bucket list i do so i have a morning formula and essentially it goes through a series of things that I'd like to do, mm -hmm. uh, but then it goes through affirmations and who I would like to be as well. And so for me, a bucket list isn't just go here or get this. Mm -hmm. It's who do I really want to become in life because it's so short. Uh, so that's really what I focus on more than anything is who I'm becoming. And if I can uh, really just focus on that, everything else will fall into place, even the material things that I, I may want if that makes sense. It absolutely makes sense. Now tell me, what's one thing that makes life worthwhile for you today? Has it changed over the years? Oh yeah, it's changed drastically. Uh, I would say it's kids, honestly. Um, I think kids are the, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's the best kept secret, but certainly for me it was. Before having kids, there was a lot of fear around that, uncertainty, um, a lot of anxiety. Even when my daughter was born, I can remember being so anxious that she might be hurt. Mm -hmm. I would even wake up in the middle of the night and like jump across my wife thinking my uh, daughter was free falling <laughs> in a bassinet trying to catch her. <laughs> <I'll be now. laughs> and yeah, that, that wore off uh, about a year into it and yep. I could really just enjoy it. Yep. I think kids are the greatest gift ever in the yep. world. I mean, a billion things, maybe more, have to go right for this child to be born. And while we can explain it, we still kind of can't. Like, if you really think about it, it's it's very hard to explain that something so incredible can come from basically nothing, you know? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and so I think it's, it's the greatest gift, and it, it really changed my life. And I started thinking about things that I had never thought about before, um, legacy, you know, bloodline, um, generations after me. 
And I'll never forget this. I was interviewing somebody actually in this room probably a year ago. And he said, I think through the lens now of, would my kids be proud of me? Would my daughter be proud of me? And I just thought that was really profound because a lot of people just don't think that way. And if you don't have kids, you probably are not going to think that way. Yeah. And so now I have two. My daughter just turned six yesterday. Uh, Her name's Aislinn. And then Ezra was born uh, a little over seven months ago. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just the fact that I was able to have kids who will be here when I'm gone, um, carry out, you know, hopefully other generations and, and people who, uh, are positive, uh, in this world and can give back and, and do good things. Um, hopefully again, that's what I, what I pray for. And, and, you know, that's what I try and instill in, in my kids. Yep. Um, I don't know. For for me, it's just really the coolest thing to think about. And when I'm with my kids, time really stands still. And when you can find those moments where you can enjoy life that much, uh, you know, w- why would you want to do anything else? Why now you, you have to, to yeah. Re- realistically. But uh, yeah, I mean, the purpose is just so much greater because yeah. it's also, I think... I think there's also something pretty symbolic in um, living for something greater than yourself. So God, you know, your kids, your spouse, um, I think that is a big realization too, where I was pretty selfish mm. and, and a lot of us can be. I think that's human nature. But I would say uh, a lot of my selfishness has worn down, which has been a really good thing. Um, and just given, again, given me a lot of perspective that I didn't have before getting married, before having kids. It's the softening of the edges, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, tell me really tell me a little is. bit about, um, I guess you've touched on legacy. And now that we're talking about children, I'd love to talk about, um, I guess, values and principles and whether or not um, they are part of the legacy that you want to leave your kids and whether or not any of those values and principles would transfer into the business space. Yeah, I think being a very given giving person is uh, a principle that I want to live by. And so I don't want to just give things away to people who are not going to steward them. But in some cases, I think you have to. Mm. If you feel called to give to that person, you just give and hope that it goes out and, and does good. But that's one thing that I'm always looking for. I can't give my time like I used to. I used to give my time a lot in the early days of business when I didn't have a lot of clients and Mm. I didn't have access to money. But now I'm able to be uh, way more generous with my finances. And that is something that uh, I do intentionally want to instill in my children. It's very important to me. I think the more that you can give away, the more that you're going to get. Yeah. But more importantly, more than getting anything, there again, it, it's it's a feeling inside of you that you've been able to help someone and do something that isn't about you. Um, because giving should not be look at me, put my name on this thing. Put, in fact, I turn that down when people are like, hey, give me your logo or mm. give me this. I'm like, hey, no. actually, I just want to give anonymously. Um, and so I'm always listening to I would I would call it God. Uh, for who I should give to in situations, whether it be a team member, yep. maybe something bad happened to the team member and I'm able to, to give to them uh, or a charity or organization. Uh, I helped a friend start uh, an anti-human trafficking nonprofit. So, um, you know, focuses in exploitation and human trafficking, bringing awareness to those areas. Mm -hmm. Um, But I was able to actually go to Vegas and go on a, what they call a big search. And I think that week that I went, uh, 40 or so kids were found by the group that I was with. That's incredible. And that was really, that was really cool too, because in that moment I could give my time. Um, But that's, that's something, just being a very generous person. There's a great book, by Truett Cathy, who founded Chick-fil-A. It's called Wealth, Is It Worth It? And I was really convicted reading that book because he talks about, 
you should only really receive wealth if you're willing to give it away. Yes. And so it's very, very powerful book. If you haven't read it, uh, he talks a lot about Warren Buffett. And I think Warren Buffett has given away his net worth maybe two times. Um, so that's, I don't know that I would do that, but that's, <laughs> you know, that's pretty, well, pretty ballsy and you substantial. Know, you give away without the, without expectation of return. I think there's a formula, a universal formula that works out. I've heard this more than once. And I think Warren Buffett's onto something there because it seems to keep, keep accumulating yeah. for him. Now, tell me yeah. a little bit. I, first and foremost, I love the hip sign behind you. Tell me a little bit about uh, hip agency. Where did the name come from? How did it all start? Tell us a story. So hip started Huel and Finger Price. My business partner, Justin, is the Huel. Obviously, I'm the in Finger, and my wife at the time was Price. And so my wife actually phased out of the agency in 2018 when we had our first child. Um, she wanted to do other things, yep. largely be a mom. So we've reinvented it internally for our team. It's really around our core values, hunger, integrity, and passion. But that's how the name originated. And when we started, we thought we would really just be a local agency serving clients in the Gulf Coast area. There's a, a big healthcare scene here. And so quickly, we began working in healthcare, working for a very prominent orthopedic surgery group. And someone heard about us. This someone was Dr. Ben Fishbein, who's an orthodontist. Long story short, we courted each other for about a year, started working together. Yep really turned into us doing all of his digital marketing. He ended up becoming the fastest growing orthodontist uh, in the country, uh, probably in the world if it was in the country, because uh, the US is the biggest orthodontic market. Mm -hmm. And that really launched us into, I'll say stardom within orthodontics, just becoming known, getting out of obscurity. He would speak on stage, no strings attached. We would be a small part of his story. Um, but then he had his own event and I went and spoke at that event and had no expectation of what would happen. And it's a small event. So there's probably maybe 10 doctors that come, they bring their team. It's called Fishbine Fundamentals. Uh, and probably I, five people came up to me right after I spoke, Hey, we want to do business with you. Um, ended up partnering with them and it just began to snowball to the degree in 2020, we declared orthodontics would be the only vertical that we worked in. Ah. And it's really been able to uh, help us expand beyond marketing. So today we have our own curriculum. We have books. We have courses. Uh, we have software. Because what we realized is while orthodontists and dentists are, are very educated people, most of them don't even take one business class. And so we began to plug all the leaks on the business side of the practice or as many as we can, because a lot of times we found when we were just doing marketing, it would really expose problems more, not fix them. It's kind of like a, a leaky bucket. Yeah. If your operations and your business has all these leaks in the bucket and you turn on the faucet, which is the marketing and the water start shooting in the bucket and going in a hundred different directions. That's not really good, uh, obviously. And so, you know, our framework has really become repairing that, that leaky bucket and getting people ready to really have success. Um, it's not overnight. It's not a light switch. While we hear all these crazy claims about marketing, most of them probably aren't very realistic it's hard work like anything else mm. and you have to be set up in a way to capitalize on the marketing. So there seems to be a balance between all different things uh, nowadays, especially in the digital space from a transition between, a, I guess, a traditional bricks and mortar as well as a digital environment. How do you uh, manage the crossover? Is there a crossover in terms of your approach? There is a crossover. Um, you know, I will say, organic as well as boots on the ground traditional marketing local marketing mm -hmm. especially for small business is very important so you know we focus on those things in regards to teaching people and um exposing them to other things they should be doing just outside of digital yeah but 
digital is probably the lowest barrier to entry and the easiest to scale because yep. you have much more control over what you're doing. So I think you, both are very important. I mean, we even tell people, hey, send mailers. People will say, oh, mail's dead. It just goes in the trash. Well, we even do it for ourselves. We just got two clients from it. Yeah, fantastic. So I, I think you can do all these other things if they're done right and you have to measure it. So something may not work for you and it worked for somebody else. Uh, maybe it doesn't work in your area or maybe you took the wrong approach. So I always tell people, I want to be everywhere. I want omnipresence. So I'm going to do direct mail. Uh, I'm going to send emails. I'm going to send text messages. Uh, I'm going to run ads on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Google, do SEO, put out content, podcast. Because the more you do, it's just visibility. And I tell people too, I just need one. I don't need 10. If I do something and it gets one new partner from it, that's great. We'll keep doing it. And it'll probably compound and scale. And so, yeah, I mean, that that's really my philosophy. But I do believe digital uh, gives us the most control. I, I know that there are so many different ways to, you know, get in front of your best clients, customers or patients. Are you finding, given all the data sets that you must have access to, is there one technique that's sticking out over others? I, I would say it's most likely Facebook ads, uh, meta ads, so Facebook and Instagram. Mm -hmm. If If you want to get in front of people, you have no brand, nobody knows who you are, you could create something of value in a day or an hour, uh, especially with chat GPT. Oh yeah. Uh, you may have to wordsmith that. it. <laughs> yeah. May have to wordsmith it a bit, beef it up. Uh, but you can create something of value. You can place an ad. You can get a lead. Now the trick is you can't just rely on automated messaging to follow up with the lead. You actually have to pick up the phone, uh, which a lot of young people don't really understand. Oh, I put them into my automation sequence. Hey, that's great. I get you know, hundreds of emails a day. I could pull up my phone right now. There'd probably be 15 missed calls. There'd oh, be yeah. voicemails from today. <laughs> I don't check any of it. Mm. So unless you have the right follow-up cadence off that lead, you're probably never going to get a hold of people. So there's a certain type of cadence you have to follow. For instance, you know, if I, I were to call Zach here, who's on the other side of me, I'd call him, leave him a voicemail. I'd send him a text right away. Hey, Zach, that was me who just called you. This is Luke at Hip Creative, blah, blah, blah. I'd probably send him an email. I'd do that again in two hours, change the messaging. I'd do that again the next day, change the messaging. Again, we're talking about persistence, but yep. he reached out to me. He wanted that thing that offered value in, in whatever it was. And then if you get a hold of somebody and you can have a good conversation with them, it's it's pretty easy. I've been able to start other companies now outside of HIP and with zero brand, uh, nobody knew who I was. I started getting clients. And so I really think first it goes back to can you offer value? Because if you can't offer value, you may be charismatic, you may be good at sales, you can sell somebody. If you can't keep the customers you have, you don't have a business. So first, I would focus on where can I create value if I'm not uh, sure. I would read a book, take a course, learn something, learn a specific vertical. I would be 100% uh, certain I can add value there. And then I would go do the marketing and the sales portion because then it's easy. Wow, I could just pick your brain for hours. I'm absolutely sure and certain of that. Thank you very much, Luke. Now, I, I, I love process automation and I love software. And I also, if I could just extend on the conversation we just had about making phone calls, I see a lot of technology around nowadays that still uses automation. They, they pre-record a message and not only will it send you an SMS, it sends you their, um, their audio message as well. Is there a place for that or do you think it has to be live? Again, I, I think you can test it. Yeah, I know for me, as soon as I hit play on a voicemail, which is maybe twice a week, and that's I believe that's voicemail drops you're referring to. Yeah, if I can tell that it's a voicemail drop, which nine times out of ten you can, you I can. hit the delete button. Yeah, hit the, the delete button. Uh, so I think people are actually craving real human connection more than ever. Yeah, and when you can do that, 
you will get more sales and clients than anybody else. You follow the same formula when you get the client. Actually call them every single week or send them a text. Hey, Zach, just checking in. How are things going? How was this week? How was this month? When you do that and continue to proactively be in front of them because they'll give you feedback. Oh, this week was terrible. This happened. Sally quit. Hey, I actually have a hiring process or I've been wanting to talk to you about attrition and how you market your business, not to customers, but to uh, talent. You know, you can find other problems and start to solve those for people. And in a way, I think you want people to somewhat be dependent on you. If you can offer value to them, this is the way of doing business. I need something. I have a problem. I'm not good at something. Uh, whatever it may be, I need this to grow. Uh, I need to do business with X, Y, and Z. So I think you have to stay in front of people. I think if you can uh, really focus on the human connection and more of a white glove approach to that, yeah. uh, that you can do just about anything you want to do and scale to any type of level within want. business. See, yeah. people, people often, and they're business owners, people often want just somebody to listen to them so they can vent, don't they? I, uh, mm -hmm. I I love this feedback. I'm sure that my future business audience are taking a lot of value away from this. Now, I'd love to talk, if we could, Luke, just briefly at least, about frameworks. You have one particular framework called PATH. Tell us about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's a funny word uh, or acronym. Yeah, it caught my attention. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, sometimes people think we're saying BARF, but, <laughs> uh, you know, it, that particular framework within HIP is the patient and acquisition uh, retention framework. And that framework has evolved over time, but more than anything, it's a branded system. So within that business, it's the patient acquisition and retention framework. Within another business I have, it's Everest. You want to have some type of branded framework. Recently, I helped my friend uh, brand Eden uh, and his agency name is Lush uh, Digital. And so I think having these branded systems, it's more memorable. memorable. Mm. If I were to tell you my framework is Everest and walk you through what that was, if you're an ideal customer, you probably remember that more than just some other person who told you about digital marketing and a website and ads. That's what everybody does. So I do think you should have some type of branded system yeah. uh, be, just because you can brand it, you can own it, and it's memorable. Yeah, that's great feedback. Thank you so very much. Now, I, I wonder, um, in all of this, there's there's a lot of complexities. We've talked about your um, primary um, vertical. Now, I wonder if they've never had a, a, like a, a bit of training in marketing before, what's the onboarding look like when, when you work with a new client? Uh, it is very detailed because we found out pretty quick if you don't turn it into baby steps and spell out every step of the way, people get confused. Uh, more than anything, people make assumptions based on past experiences or what they think marketing should be. So onboarding for us is 21 business days. So it's a month. And Every step is laid out. In fact, in our sales process, we play a video once they're they're ready to move forward. We don't play a video with sound. We play a video with visuals uh -huh. and it animates all the steps on screen while we talk through it live. So we're able to pause it, yep. scrub through it, go back. Even down to there's three calls during onboarding, it shows who should be on the call because we would find that the wrong person would join the call, or maybe the whole team would join the call, the strategy call that we're supposed to have with the business owner. And so I really think you have to take the time to lay out all the steps. You don't want to get too detailed to where you're showing them everything that happens behind the scenes, but everything they need to be aware of, you probably will even have to show them three times. So uh, we show them that video. Uh, the video is also in a contract and they initial that they watch it and understand it. Mm -hmm. And then if people have questions after, we send them a link to the video that does have sound. Ah. So the onboarding steps are very, very important because a lot of agencies will lose a lot of people during onboarding, 
you know, nobody likes the the boring stuff and onboarding can be very boring because you're getting access to accounts. People don't know logins, passwords. Um, there's a lot of little things and you have to get information from people. Uh, it's not just, hey, sign up with Details. us and we'll have ads live. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Great feedback. Now, how does it make you feel as the leader of the business when you actually see results and it's changing businesses' lives? How does that make you feel? Well, I think that's what it should be about. That's why we went into businesses. We wanted to help people. Mm. And there's a lot of things I didn't know in the beginning. I still don't know a lot. I still am learning. But uh, when I was able to learn about somebody's business and behind the scenes put a plan together that I really believed in and then I saw it working, one, it's one of the best feelings you can have professionally, but then two, you get confidence and then you're able to find new ways of doing things or iterate and make it even better. And so that's what I'm always hoping for and looking for is success stories. And what I found actually is that it's pretty easy to do because most people overlook very simple things. When you're in the business and you're not able to zoom out, a lot of times you'll let things happen or let things slide uh, because it can be very overwhelming day to day when you're in it and yeah. when you're working long hours and working hard. So for instance, in orthodontics, they say if one new patient phone call is missed a day for a year, that's a million dollars in production that your business missed. Wow. So imagine if you could just scrutinize one thing, the phones, and make sure that you never missed a new patient phone call again. I mean, hypothetically, you could grow your business by a million or in some cases, several million, because I will tell you most orthodontic offices are missing anywhere from 10 to 20% of their phone calls. Within that, there's several new patients a day or per week Waiting. that they're missing. Yeah. Yeah. Now, a lot of offices are closed on Friday. Um, no office is open on Saturday. And that's when people are off probably researching, making uh, inquiries and phone calls. So just by focusing on one thing uh, and working with somebody and perfecting that, I could grow their business by or help them grow their business by a million dollars a year. I think most people... Uh, would be pretty interested in doing that. Uh, so yeah, I I think it's where I'm going with this. It's really uh, about the uh, foundational things uh, that you can do in a business. It doesn't always have to be this new AI sexy thing. Yeah, look, small hinges swing big doors, they say. And uh, as I've mentioned earlier, Luke, you have so much to offer, so much talent, so much experience. Now, if somebody wants to learn more and uh, maybe even work with you, um, where are they going to find you? Uh, I would say you could go to hip.agency. You could go to the contact us page or you could email me directly at Luke at Hip Creative Inc. That's I-N-C. Dot yep. com. Yep. Uh, either would work. Fantastic. Well, look, if you're on today's call and you've loved what you've seen, if you're in the vertical that Luke's uh, hip agency serves, make sure you reach out. There will be a link uh, below this call. No matter where you listen to it or watch it, you're going to find those li uh, links back to Luke and his wonderful team at hip agency. And with all that being said, Luke, what a wonderful call. Thank you so very much for joining me on the show today. Thanks for having me.